Hello uh, and welcome to my talk. My name is David Vesakovic. I'm a software engineer uh, at Ververica and uh, today I'd like you to walk you through the Flinx uh, check bending mechanism. Um, I want to explain, I, I will ex try to explain how it works, um, how to set it up if you're starting with uh, uh, fault tolerance within Flink and also uh, I'd like you, you to I'd like to describe you some of the few uh, latest additions we introduced to improve or to help uh, with the situation in, we, in which checkpoints take long. Um, so to begin with, I'd like to quickly explain why do we even need to bother with uh, checkpointing. Um, so yeah, like if we have um, a um, processing pipeline, like we pretty much in most of the cases will have some kind of a state uh, even if we have just a simple um, map function not to say that it, of course like it's obvious if we have um, some aggregating operations like counting the elements calculating the average or so on like the, the, the average is then state because it's combined over multiple records but even if we have just a simple um, map transformation that transforms a simple single object to a different one uh, we still have uh, source operators where, which for example uh, need to store um, we need to keep track of the offsets that if they've read so far uh, so like we, we, uh, until which position in the uh, input data for example in Kafka with with uh, consume the record uh, and up to or what, what's going to be the next record of course as i said if we have aggregates that's just obvious like that's that's another uh, kind of state um yeah and honestly like the the fun begins when we have to deal with a failure because like what happens um what can we do or what should happen if one of the, for example one of the uh, operators just just yeah fails um in case of stream processing when the the the, the input or we cannot simply just repro reprocess everything from scratch um, usually um, stream processing is subject to some kind of a uh, retention policy or like it's just that the data is so huge that that we cannot spend hours to um to, to, to replay everything and, and uh, rebuild all of the state. Uh, so we need some kind of a way to, to persist that over a failure and, and recover from, uh, from the state that we've calculated so far. Uh, there are two approaches, uh, usually. Uh, the first one being an external state where we keep uh, the state in an external persisted system and on every axis, every change, uh, goes into that external system and the other one which we're gonna talk today about is uh, when we have the uh, state internal local um, towards the, the the processor and only uh, periodically we take snapshots of that state so that we can later on after a failure recover from that and uh, copy and, and recreate the state and um, of course like those two approaches have uh, benefits and and, uh, and downsides. Mm, so for example, if we have the external state, uh, we can scale it uh, like the the, the uh, state is independent from processing. So we can rescale uh, with like the processor doesn't have to deal with the uh, rescaling and so on. Like that's that's uh, taken care of externally, uh, but it's much slower because like every access needs to go there over the network uh, and and so on. It's also really hard to get exactly one's guarantee, um, because like then you have to coordinate multiple different systems um, with different uh, guarantees and so on, like within pretty much a single transaction. If we, on the other hand, if we have a uh, internal state uh, all of the accesses are much faster because like we just need to access the the state lo locally um, yeah, it, it's all local uh, it's also much easier to to implement the high highly consistent uh, snapshots because like we can uh, which I'm gonna show you in just a second uh, create a distributed 
uh, aligned snapshot of all uh, entire state of the uh, processing. Unfortunately, like the the, the downside uh, is that the stream processor needs to take care of um, uh, of of more things. Like for example, it needs to handle scaling of the state. Uh, it needs needs to uh, handle the the storage and so on. Uh, but yeah, you as a user, you don't necessarily need to take uh, deal with this. Like it's it's handled uh, by Flink itself. Yeah. So uh, today, the, the the checkpointing and and uh, and snapshots and the, how Flink works is that it uses the, uh, the notion of internal state. Um, so as I said, like in order to um, to be able to survive the failures and recover after failure with um, with the state not, not without need to uh, replay everything from from scratch, uh, Flink implements the algorithm of uh, distributed snapshots, which is uh, similar to the uh, Shandy Lamper uh, algorithm, um, yeah, which uh, works in the way that periodically we trigger a uh, checkpoint so like uh, periodically uh, from the checkpoint coordinator which resides within within the job manager um, which is a single coordinator of the entire pipeline we uh, send messages or send information to all of the source uh, operators or source tasks that we should begin uh, creating the, uh, the the snapshot of the system of the state. Uh, and as soon as that uh, that comes through an RPC call, uh, all of the uh, input operators, all of the sources, uh, take snapshots or take a copy of their state and store that in a uh, distributed uh, storage system. And once they do that, uh, they emit barriers uh, downstream so that within the network channels like they they flow through the graph exactly in the same manner as uh, all the other regular records that are being processed in the pipeline um yeah so the, so the, the barriers flow through the graph uh, and yeah pretty much the, in, in the same way as uh, all the other records um and from the perspective of a single operator um, there's a special uh, alignment phase. So, that, like as soon as the one of the barrier on one of the channels reach an um, operator, uh, it's not enough uh, to. Uh, it's it's not the point where it can already snapshot its state, because uh, it has to um, wait until. Uh, barriers on all the channels arrive. Uh, that's be uh, that's because um, we need to make sure that the state is taken uh, exactly at the same point, like from the exact same set of records that uh, uh, that the upstream um, operator created its state with. So we cannot uh, start consuming the, the records where where the the barrier arrived. Because those should belong to the uh, next checkpoint. Uh, so yeah, like we need to wait until the barrier on the other channel uh, reaches the operator, and only once this is done, like once all the barriers on all of the channels arrive at the operator, we can create a copy of, uh, of the state of the operator. Uh, we can store that in a distributed uh, storage system and emit a barrier downstream. And that that happens for all of the operators. So like that's that's uh, happening for uh, for the operators one after another. And once um, all of the operators, all of the terminal operators um, snapshot their state, um, the the checkpoint can be assumed to be complete. Uh, so the the checkpoint with that ID, because like every um, checkpoint has an unique ID, uh, which is an increasing ID. Um, is considered done, it's considered finished, and it can be, uh, and the, the graph or like the pipeline can be later uh, recovered from that checkpoint if a failure uh, appears. Um, yeah. Um, so now uh, I'd like you to, to walk you through a few uh, tw tweaks, knobs, which are quite important for when setting up the 
um, checkpointing in Flink. Uh, so first of all, what you need to decide on is uh, what state backend you want to use. State backend is the thing uh, where we keep the working copy uh, of the state, like the local uh, local data that, that's being accessed by each operator. Uh, and uh, Flink gives um, gives you a choice of two state backends uh, right now. Um, so first of all, you can uh, use the HashMap state backend, which keeps all of the state in memory. Um, or you can use RocksDB uh, state backend, embedded RocksDB state backend, um, which uh, uses a, a co-located uh, RocksDB key value storage um, uh, where it puts all of the um, local state. The, the main diff like the, 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 the core deciders between like choosing uh, which one to use is that like if you use the hashmap state backend, um, it's it, it's gonna be faster like the, the because the state is kept in a memory so like all of the accesses are just uh, within the memory so you don't need to serialize this or anything but at the same time because like everything's kept in memory uh, we are limit limited by the size of the memory that, that we have available on the other hand rocksdb um, even though it caches some of some of the records in memory uh, it can it, it can spill uh, spill the data into disks so uh, it has to serialize, deserialize uh, the data, uh, and uh, and yeah, and that's that's why usually uh, RoseDB uh, state backend will be around ten times slower. But at the same, uh, but because it spills and serializes, uh, the the um, we are not limited by memory, but only by the disk size. So pretty much like that's that's uh, yeah, most cases that's that's unlimited. Um, another th so just just to give you a th quick hint how how to uh, choose which state backend to use like this this is how you configure the state backend and the good thing starting from uh, Flink one thirteen is that you don't need to um, you don't need to be stuck with the check uh, state backend that that you use when you first run your job. Um, it's, you can uh, take a save point um, and then over that like and, and you can restore from that save point uh, and, and at the same time switch uh, the state backend. So what I would recommend you if you are not sure which state backend is the right choice for you to start with uh, cash map state backend like the one that, that keeps the data in memory and if it doesn't work for you like if, if you see that, that you're um, running out of memory um, you can uh, then take a save point and uh, switch over to RocksDB. Um, another thing that's that's really really important to uh, configure when uh, when going into production is uh, to uh, you need to define where uh, to where Flink should store the um, the distributed snapshots. Uh, well, it's it's very important because like by default, Flink will use the job manager checkpoint storage, which will keep the uh, the checkpoints, the snapshots in job manager's memory. But uh, and this will survive any failures of task managers. But if if the job job manager goes away, unfortunately, um, it like uh, the 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 checkpoint checkpoints uh, will go away with uh, go away with this job manager so that it's really vital uh, that if you're going into production to use the file system checkpoint storage which will store the the files in some kind of a distributed persistent persistent reliably reliable uh, file system uh, and uh, this is uh, this is really really important so that you uh, provide the, the the path uh, to a file uh, to the file system where you uh, want to store the checkpoints. Lastly, if you want to enable uh, the, the checkpoints, you need to provide the checkpoint in interval, which is the uh, how often do we um, will Flink trigger the checkpoints. Uh, and uh, the, the, now is the question 
what should be the value? Like, well, how often should we uh, trigger checkpoints? And uh, before you can answer uh, that question, um, I recommend to ask yourself some some helper uh, helper ones. Like, for example, what's the SLA of of your service? How much data can you? And this means how much data uh, you can reprocess. Like, how, after a failure, how how long can you wait? How uh, to to rewind? Um, uh, how much time of data you can uh, basically lose and, and replay uh, after uh, after a failure. Another thing to consider is to um, just like of course, uh, even though like majority of the checkpointing happens asynchronously in the background uh, of of regular processing, still it puts some extra effort on uh, on task managers. Uh, both in in case of uh, I/O uh, and in CPU, because like it it needs to upload the uh, the copy of the of the state the the checkpoints to the distributed system, um, and so on. So like the the more frequently, uh, so yeah, that's 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 a thing that that you need to uh, to think about. Lastly, um, you need to think. Um, how often you want to have your uh, results to be published? Like that's that's vital in case of ex exactly once processing, because like we can only commit transactions uh, once uh, they a corresponding checkpoint completes. Um, that that that's because like if we uh, if we were to to fail over to a previous checkpoint, uh, which don't. Uh, which doesn't uh, contain uh, those records in, in the, the transactions, um, we, would, we would replay them. So like, the, we would not be able to, we would violate the ex exactly one's guarantees. Um, so that's why we can uh, only commit transactions if the uh, corresponding checkpoint completes so that we won't uh, like recreate the records in that transactions. Um, yeah, so like choosing the right, um, value for the checkpoint interval is a trade-off. Um, if you configure it to, to have less frequent checkpoints, you put less uh, runtime overhead, uh, but at the same time, in case of failover, you need to process more data. Uh, and if you checkpoint less frequently, you commit your results uh, less frequently. Uh, and on the opposite, if you checkpoint uh, more frequently, uh, you put more runtime overhead onto your uh, processing on, onto your pipeline that you need to reprocess less data uh, and your results will be published more frequently. So yeah, I, my recommendation here would be to just uh, try it yourself um, and, and play around with the configuration. What's the right choice for your pipeline, depending on what's your pipeline doing. Um, in the next section, um, um, like the the problem um, or a, a common uh, issue is when once we are uh, running our pipelines, is that it might happen that um, that pipelines just take uh, long uh, checkpoints take long to uh, to complete. Uh, so in order to overcome those problems, we introduced a few. Um, uh, improvements, but to uh, not to s spoil uh, the, the surprise, maybe let's first uh, try to identify a few causes uh, for that. So and and how to um, see if there's something wrong with um, uh, with our checkpointing process. So for example, if we see a long start delay in our um, in our pipeline. Uh, so if we look into our web UI, uh, in the, into history of checkpoints and, and checkpoint metrics, uh, we can see that, uh, that the, let's say that the majority of end-to-end uh, -end duration of a checkpoint uh, is uh, taken by the start delay. What's a start delay? So a uh, start delay is, um, is basically um, a time which it takes for a buyer to uh, arrive for the first barrier of a given ID to arrive an, uh, at an operator. So at uh, the barriers uh, created uh, in the checkpoint coordinator at a given point at a given time t1, and then uh, it arrives at t2. Uh, 
onto uh, some some operator. And the start delay for that particular oper operator is the difference between those two times. Um, another uh, issue uh, related to how fast barriers travel through the graph uh, is that the alignment phase or the alignment duration is long. Uh, so for example, uh, yeah, similarly as before, uh, but this time the start delay is relatively fine, uh, but we might see a long alignment time the duration, that the duration takes the majority of time of, uh, of the time of the checkpoint. Uh, and this is uh, this is usually uh, caused by some some uh, slow tasks, some some tasks that cause back pressure, and they don't um, and they might they're processing the the data much slower, and in the same way uh, they uh, cause buyers to tra travel slowly through the graph. So it might ha it might happen uh, that um, yeah that some buyers just travel pretty quickly through the graph. Uh, and some are just stuck and and, uh, and move forward really slowly. Uh, so usually in that case, if we have such a slow task, uh, just just by uh, by the, def the definition of like and uh, by uh, yeah, like it, it just is is reasonable uh, that this uh, slow task will observe, uh, for example, long start delay because like it's, it it itself. Um, the processes data rather slowly, so it won't see any of those barriers uh, for quite some time. So it will result in a long start delay. Whereas those tasks, because like some of the barriers can uh, travel quickly, they will see those barriers. Uh, so the start delay will be rather uh, or relatively small, uh, reasonable. Uh, but the alignment time can be long, because like those barriers need to travel through uh, through this. Uh, task first, so they won't see um, the buyer for some time in here. Um, and to address exactly that issue, uh, that the buyers flow through the graph rather slowly, um, we we try to, to to introduce some uh, built-in uh, solutions um, for that exact problem. And in this uh, Flink uh, one eleven. Uh, the first one uh, was we, that we introduced unaligned checkpoints. And uh, the idea is because, um, like before, uh, in a regular aligned checkpoints, um, checkpoints cannot uh, overtake uh, records. So we first need to uh, consume all of the records, process all of the records, and only after that we can um, create snapshots. In unaligned checkpoints, that's not the case. As soon as we see uh, barrier in the input uh, channels, we uh, move that to the very beginning. So we in immediately start consuming that, that barrier. Um, and uh, once we do that, we, um, we uh, move that barrier uh, at the very end of the output uh, channels. Um, and we create, uh, but the, the difference from aligned checkpoints is, uh, is that in this case, uh, checkpoint will not contain only just the state of um, of the operator itself, but also uh, all of the records that the uh, checkpoint by barrier over over to. Uh, so yeah, basically, uh, we'll like skip processing those records, but we'll then store those uh, records raw records. Uh, along with the uh, with the state, um, so if you want to try that out, uh, you can just you, you need to enable that because they are uh, disabled by default. Um, yeah, and the, the the decision if you should or should not uh, uh, enable uh, the, the the snapshots is uh, basically the trade off uh, between. Um, is it faster uh, to process the data, or is it faster to uh, write that data out to to the external to the snapshot storage? Uh, because like the the downside is that the uh, there's more data to uh, to 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 store to snapshot because we additionally need to store the the channel state, and it will also take a bit longer to uh, 
um, recover from the checkpoint because at the very beginning we need to uh, replay and, and reprocess all of the stored data. Uh, on the other hand, if we uh, if we enable that, it should fix the um, the initial problem that the barrier uh, travels slowly. But that's the case if if the uh, yeah like if if, uh, if the processing uh, of the data takes long. Uh, another uh, solution uh, that we thought about is buffer bloating, which is the newest addition in the latest uh, Flink release, which was released just a couple of uh, we uh, weeks ago, uh, which is called buffer bloating. And the idea behind that is, um, the, the core idea is uh, um, that by default, uh, we can um, buffer quite a lot of data in the net network channels. So not not uh, not within the operator, but but like the the upstream operator can produce uh, quite a quite a lot of data that will be kept in the network buffers in the network stack, uh, and uh, the the downstream operator uh, will take a long time to process that data until it. Uh, it will consume the checkpoint barrier in case the, the checkpoint barrier doesn't uh, is, is aligned. Uh, yeah, it is aligned. Uh, and the uh, the idea here, so like if if those channels keep long to um, to be processed, uh, yeah, the, the barrier will uh, arrive pretty late. And the idea in buffer debloating is basically to um, always keep um, to keep only. Uh, or to to to, uh, um, to decrease the number of data that 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 can be buffered in to, in network stack. So basically, we can we say that that we store only um, only a given amount of data that can be processed in let's say a second. Uh, that's by the way the default value for the buffer buffer debloating target, which you can uh, ch change, but. Uh, we think that that one second is a same uh, same default, and of course that's also a um, that's also a feature that's uh, disabled by default because like it's a new addition. So if you want to try it out, um, yeah, you you need to uh, enable that. Um, yeah, so that was it. Uh, I hope that the presentation will give you uh, a good overview of what what is a, ch a checkpointing. Why do you need that? How to um, configure that initially if you're starting with Flink? And also, what can you do if you see that your checkpoints uh, take quite long? Um, great. So, of course, some some hiring slides. So, if you're interested in working with Favorica, uh I invite you to, to check out the, our page. Um, and. If there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Um, yeah, thank you.